It's my pleasure to see here international participants, colleagues from Czech universities, and also our dear guests. I hope I can say friends from University of Granada, University of Technology Malaysia, Oslo Metropolitan University, and also our neighbors from University of Pakistan. Okay. This year, we celebrate 20th anniversary. Nevet's Economic Days was founded in 2022 as banking sector, a regional development conference. There were only two tracks, 32 articles in total. Nowadays, in 2022, we offer seven tracks, three workshops. Our proceeding contains 95 articles by authors from 13 countries. For this success, I would like to thank to our regular partner from Krakow University of Economics, Wroclaw University of Economics, and this year also co-founding partner, Gwennett Krauwe Region. For this 20th anniversary, we invited not only academists, but also representatives from companies and public sector. The aim is to bring together commercial and academic sphere. The conference has an ambition to be a, net, to be a networking platform for research and innovation. <coughs> I sincerely hope that, the, that on the 30th anniversary, the Hradec Economic Days will be even bigger, more diverse, and that we meet together again. Enjoy the conference. Thank you, and a few warm words would also like to say our Rector of the University of Hradec Králové, Professor Kamil Kuča. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, I am really glad uh, that I see here so many uh, friends, uh, colleagues. Uh, I, after two years with COVID and now uh, under the Ukraine crisis, uh, uh, I am glad that Although there is so many bad things around the world, you are coming to our beautiful city and our beautiful uh, university. Uh, all those days will be for sure very productive and uh, there will be probably established too many new connections which, be, which will uh, make social, uh, so, uh, social impact uh, on the world. And I hope I will enjoy the time with you. I skip all my plan for the next two days to be here and share and uh, share my knowledge, but also absorb knowledge from you and to be much more uh, intelligent, hope, hopefully. But uh, uh, I think that uh, such community of economists and managers is important for the society and I am very glad that I am part of this. So thank you very much and enjoy the meeting and uh, uh, your stay in Hradec Králové city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Rector. And the last but certainly not the least who wishes to greet an audience is the Dean of Faculty of Informatics and Management, Josef Hinek. Also, oh, yes. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you at the Faculty of Informatics and Management of the University of Hradec Králové. Uh, many things have been already said and uh, let's say my only advantage in this respect is my memory because I have been here 20 years ago. So I will just make two short remarks. And first one is that there were three people who were really crucial for the success of this conference. And I am really glad that they are here with us today as well. First of all, it's uh, Ladislav Hayek. Second one is Pavel Jedlička. And because uh, behind every success, there must be a woman as well. That is the first lady of the conference, Jaroslava Detrichova. I have seen her uh, when we had the coffee, but I can't see her right now. Nevertheless, let me thank to all those three people because they devoted many, many years 
to this conference and it's because of them that this conference is so successful. So please join me in the round of applause for Mr. Hayek, Mr. Jedlička and Mrs. Dietrichova. I have promised two remarks. So the second one is that from my memory I can recall that uh, this conference usually took place in the end of January, beginning of February. And it was famous for a lot of snow, extreme frost, uh, everything closed, uh, problems with heating and so on. So we have changed the schedule and right now the conference takes place in the beginning of June, which is the period which is here in the uh, Czech Republic associated with rain. So instead of heavy snowfall, you will observe some heavy rain later, later this afternoon. Nevertheless, there is uh, another important coincidence. I am sure that uh, most of you observed uh, Platinum Jubilee of Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II last week. She celebrated 70 years on the throne. And right now, one week after, we are celebrating 20 years of Hradec Králové economic days. And because I'm a mathematician, it's easy to calculate that when Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth will celebrate Centennial Jubilee, and because she is a very persistent lady, I am very sure that she will make it. In 2052, one week after her Jubilee, we will meet in this room for the 50th Hradec Králové Economic Days. So I'm looking forward to meet you here in 30 years, and we will celebrate it together. <laughs> And as I mentioned the Queen, I can't finish my speech uh, otherwise than saying God save the Queen and God bless Hradec Kralo Economic Days. Enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, after our introduction, there is the first speaker who came as a representative. Executive Director of the Monetary Department, Mr. Petr Kral. Please join the stage and I thank you to our Chairman, our Rector and our Dean for welcoming our audience. Thank you for the floor. Uh, good morning uh, also from my side, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, let me start by expressing my deep gratitude to the organizers for having invited me to this excellent, beautiful conference. It is really my great uh, pleasure and honor to be able to represent uh, here the Czech National Bank and to share our expertise in macroeconomic uh, analysis, analysis, modeling and forecasting with you. The topic of my uh, presentation and the slides I am going to present is the outcome of a long-term uh, intensive work of a group of people comprising the team of our Fiscal Analysis Unit, uh, to which I belonged uh, several years ago. And I hope that our expertise and our way how to uh, work with fiscal policy uh, as an as a input for uh, macroeconomic forecasts uh, provided uh, regularly on a quarterly basis by the Czech National Bank will be of an excellent interest uh, also for this, for this uh, uh, conference. Let me start by uh, introdu introducing the structure of my presentation. First, I will uh, identify channels uh, through which fiscal policy influences uh, monetary policy. Then I will uh, provide you with an explanation how to evaluate uh, real effects of fiscal policy. After that, um, uh, I will be uh, describing the role the policy plays in the uh, CNB's quarterly macroeconomic forecasting procedure. And I will also mention uh, policy interactions between fiscal and monetary policies. Uh, Last but one part of my presentation will be dedicated to the actual or current uh, fiscal outlook and final part of my presentation will summarize and conclude. 
There are basically three major uh, channels uh, through which monetary policy affects uh, economic and inflation. In our case, the Czech National Bank has been conducting its monetary policy within the inflation targeting regime for more than 20 years. And our primary tool for influencing inflation is our uh, uh, interest rate, uh, interest rate to week uh, repo rate. So there are three major channels, the exchange rate channel, the interest rate and credit channel, and the asset price channel. Uh, the exchange rate channel can be described as an influence of the changes of nominal and real exchange rate on economic activity and import prices and via this on the uh, final outcome which is the inflation outlook and inflation developments as such. The second major channel, interest rate and credit channel, uh, consists in influencing uh, market interest rates, market uh, interest rates on the financial market through which the client interest rates uh, on deposits and on, on uh, credits in the banking sector are indirectly influenced, which is stimulating uh, the demand or destimulating the demand of uh, households and uh, corporates for take, uh, to, 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 to take credits and to finance consumption or investment uh, pro projects. And here, there is the first potential interaction between fiscal and monetary side because uh, fiscal policy is typically uh, using uh, deficit financing. Uh, the, uh, the government sector is issuing uh, public debt, government uh, bonds, and uh, the prices of these bonds and the, uh, and the uh, government bond yields are a natural benchmark for the nominal interest rates in the economy, especially when we look at the longer term horizon uh, across the uh, yield curve. That's why, Every ceteris uh, paribus uh, or uh, anything else being equal, the fiscal policy by, provi uh, by conducting uh, unsustainable fiscal policy, for example, could influence uh, the monetary policy channel, this interest rate channel, by imposing additional premium between monetary policy rates and the financial market interest rates because the government bond yields uh, under such situation could be uh, seen in the eyes of the global investors or financial investors as having extra risk premium, which is simultaneously influencing the overall uh, level of interest rates in the economy. That's why this, this uh, potential uh, influence of the fiscal policy and fiscal and public debt is, uh, necessary, necess is uh, needed to be taken account by, by the central bank when, when setting uh, interest rates. The final channel is the asset price channel or wealth channel uh, uh, through which the uh, central bank influences the perceived uh, wealth of uh, economic agents when increasing uh, nominal interest rates, the, uh, f uh, the future, uh, future uh, uh, value of, uh, of the asset uh, uh, revenues uh, will decline and that is influencing uh, the current consumption and current investment. Besides these, these three uh, major channels, there is also an expectation uh, channel which uh, plays an important role, especially under certain circumstances, such as high inflation uh, periods, which are currently uh, 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 prevailing uh, in, the, in the domestic and uh, uh, foreign economies. Uh, more important or more, more, more uh, uh, straightforward influence of fiscal policy on what, to, uh, what, the, what the monetary policy does and what the monetary policy takes into account is the effect of fiscal policy on the uh, total demand in the economy and on the, uh, on the economic, uh, economic activity. This can, be, uh, this can be described as uh, the fiscal discretion or fiscal discretionary measures which are taken by the government or by the political uh, side in general uh, to influence the aggregate economic activity uh, within functioning of and within fulfilling of uh, the three uh, major uh, fiscal policy uh, functions, which is uh, allocation function, uh, stabilization function, and redistributive uh, function. These uh, discre discretionary fiscal uh, measures are aimed to influence uh, concrete parameters on both uh, on either revenues or expenditure side of uh, public budgets and can be seen uh, as a input for the development of private consumption 
investment or government, government consumption. Those fiscal discretionary measures are taken as an exogenous decision of the political scene to influence public revenues and public uh, expenditures, and as such are uh, taken as an exogenous factor for monetary policy standing completely outside the control of the central bank. Because this is a, an outcome of the political process and the real, ruling coalition based on its uh, program is uh, putting uh, forward uh, proposals of uh, new law and amendments of the existing law to influence certain uh, parameters such as tax rates and assessment base and, uh, and um, the, the rates of uh, depreciations uh, of, uh, of the, um, of the, of the uh, uh, of uh, the existing capital, uh, capital uh, stock in the firms and, and uh, on, the expenditure, on the expenditure side, these fiscal discretions uh, directly influence uh, public investment or public consumption, wages in public sector, etc. So those are effects standing beyond the cyclical effects from the economy on the revenue and expenditure side of public budgets. Uh, this is something standing on the top of that functioning of so-called built-in fiscal, uh, fiscal uh, stabilizers. Uh, how we are able to uh, evaluate effects of such uh, fiscal discretionary uh, policy on the economy, uh, for that we need to identify the fiscal discretion and uh, to calculate the effect of such a, a fiscal discretion on the demand side uh, in, the, in the economy. So we are now talking about effect of fiscal policy standing behind or standing, standing on the top of uh, the effects of fiscal policy uh, uh, functioning through the built-in uh, automatic uh, stabilizers that also influence uh, the economic activity, but automatically without any ad hoc discretion from the ruling coalition or from the government, such as the unemployment benefits that uh, behave uh, uh, in correlation with the unemployment rate, which, which is a cyclical economic variable, uh, the uh, tax revenues, which also tend to copy the uh, development of uh, macroeconomic basis, or for example, government spending that uh, typically uh, uh, tends to have uh, quite high inertia. So the government uh, discretionary measures could be identified using uh, basically two major approaches. Those are bottom-up approach or uh, top-down approach. The bottom-up approach uh, consists in uh, summing up uh, individual revenue and expenditure budgetary measures expressed as a share of uh, nominal GDP, whereas the top-down approach uh, tries to identify the final fiscal position or fiscal policy stance measured in an annual change of uh, structural budget to deficit, uh, structural de deficit to GDP ratio in percentage points. I will go into more detail uh, regarding these two approaches in the uh, following slides. And those two approaches, and we do so, uh, can be combined together for a kind of uh, cross-checking. The bottom-up approach uh, then uh, takes into account the sum of the uh, impacts of individual uh, fiscal measures as they are imposed or um, approved by the government. And as we are able to count these effects ex ante, this, this uh, bottom-up approach is absolutely key when you need to forecast economic uh, developments and you, you need to assess the effects of fiscal policy on future economic uh, developments. That's why we need information about how the individual fiscal measure that is going to be imposed on the economy uh, will affect the concrete or the uh, uh, individual uh, demand side components. And that's why we need to uh, rely on expertise of our colleagues from Ministry of Finance who need to calculate uh, the fiscal uh, impact of such a uh, um, uh, um, the fiscal, fiscal policy measure. That's why we use explanatory reports of the laws and of the, of the regulations that uh, 
are um, sent to the uh, interministerial uh, comments procedure, which is um, conducted between uh, individual industries when some uh, suggestion is uh, law suggestion is is prepared. We take a look at uh, um, uh, the major uh, publications of our colleagues from Ministry of Finance. Uh, which are uh, fiscal outlook or convergence program, and we also rely on our own uh, expert assessment. One important thing is that revenue side measures are typically well documented, whereas the expenditure uh, discretion usually needs to be approximated because the exact calculation is not possible. That's why we calculate uh, the uh, expenditure side measures uh, typically as a deviation from the long-term uh, trend uh, of the individual uh, expenditure component vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the GDP, uh, GDP level. Uh, when, when summing up these uh, budgetary, budgetary uh, impacts uh, of individual fiscal measures, we multiply them by partial fiscal multipliers. You definitely know the concept of fiscal multiplier from economic theory. So we need to uh, have an, uh, a view how the one particular fiscal discretionary measures influence one particular uh, demand side component and with, with uh, which uh, multiplying effect this influences the overall uh, GDP, GDP outcome. That's why we derived a battery of uh, uh, very sophisticated analytical methods to be able to come up with uh, the best possible estimate of such a uh, fiscal, fiscal uh, uh, multipliers. Those are partial, so those, are, uh, those, those differ um, across individual demand side components and across individual uh, revenue and expenditure side measures uh, imposed by, by, the, by the government. So I will not go into much detail in, in this, but here you can, you can uh, see a table summarizing uh, how uh, Czech National Bank, IMF, and OECD estimates the level of uh, individual fiscal, uh, fiscal multipliers uh, der uh, derived from uh, methods used, uh, used uh, for calculating them. The biggest ones are associated with the measures on the, ex uh, on the re expenditure side, especially when it comes to government investment or government uh, consumption, whereas the multipliers on the uh, uh, revenue side such as the capital taxation or uh, consumption taxation uh, tend to have relatively um, marginal, marginal effect when expressed in multiplying, uh, multiplying effect. Uh, having uh, the sum of discretionary measures, having uh, the individual uh, fiscal multipliers, we can, uh, multi we can uh, uh, end up with uh, the final outcome of such an exercise, which is the fiscal impulse. So fiscal impulse is the aggregate, uh, let's say, ag aggregate outcome of this exercise, saying uh, to what extent the fiscal policy, discretionary fiscal policy of the government, is influencing uh, the economic uh, activity in the country in individual year. Uh, here in, you can see in this graph that uh, we are able to construct a time series of such a uh, fiscal discretionary uh, of, of, of such a fiscal policy uh, fiscal policy uh, effects of this uh, fiscal impulse, and for each year you can see that we are even able to uh, disentangle the impulse into the private consumption, private investment, government investment, and EU EU fund uh, related uh, fiscal uh, fiscal impulse. This was the uh, bottom-up approach, and for uh, cross-checking the effects, we also used top-down approach, which is, typic uh, which is based on the identification of the fiscal stance, which uh, is measured as an annual change in government, uh, general government uh, structural balance. Uh, here, it is necessary to define the uh, budget structural balance, which is the headline uh, balance cyclically adjusted, net of one-off and temporary, temporary measures. This is a standard uh, internationally uh, recognized uh, uh, way how to, how to describe uh, fiscal policy, whether it is uh, restrictionary or expansionary, and the fiscal uh, stance uh, as an annual change of this, uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal, uh, of this structural balance could be also uh, described as a 
fiscal effort, when a country needs fiscal consolidation, a year-on-year -year change of this fiscal, uh, uh, of the, the structural balance is also sometimes uh, uh, described as a fiscal, fiscal effort. Uh, here, we cannot imply, uh, apply individual uh, multipliers, but we have to rely on a de-aggregate fiscal uh, multiplier, which we estimate to be uh, 0 0.6, uh, to be able then to, uh, uh, to, uh, to get also the final fiscal, fiscal impulse. This method, uh, rather than being used for uh, ex-ante forecasting, uh, uh, <clears throat> the forecasting uh, manner, it is used for cross-checking and for making a possible uh, re retrospective ex post assessment of the actual performance of the fiscal, uh, fiscal policy. Uh, when estimating structural balance, we need to identify one-off and temporary measures, which are typically curve decisions or natural disasters or or um, extension of the lease of supersonic fighter aircraft or the sales of uh, frequency bands to mobile operators. So one of extraordinary measures that are not typically behaving or uh, taking place each year and could be put aside. And, and more basically, we need to uh, adjust the uh, series of public revenues and public uh, uh, expenditures by the existence of the business cycle. That's why this is the CAB, or cyclically adjusted balance. So we need to extract the cyclical effects on both revenue and uh, expenditure side of, of uh, uh, public budgets. This could be done by two methods. Uh, aggregate method is uh, related to the output gap, which is basically the, de the deviation of the actual economic activity from the estimated potential output, or by the disaggregated method, which is something uh, relatively technical, which I'm not going to uh, spend much time on, on, on that. But having this at our disposal, we are able to disentangle the past uh, observed development of fiscal policy outcome by saying this was the headline uh, deficit, this was the structural balance, which is cyclically adjusted, one of, uh, net of one of measures, and this is the cyclical component, this is outside the control of the government because it is under direct influence of the economy as such. And as you can see here, Czech government uh, budget deficit uh, typically uh, sh uh, show a quite high level of persistency and have predominantly structural character. The uh, red bars or the, the, or, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the red bars are uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, the, the red bars embody, embody structural balance, and you can see that uh, in the um, uh, uh, majority of the years, the structural balance was able to explain the uh, majority of the headline, uh, headline deficit, whereas the cyclical component, which are the blue bars, uh, are, are only uh, uh, mildly behaving or hovering uh, around zero, uh, sh saying that in our specific case, the business, uh, the position of the economy within the business cycle explains relatively limited part of the effect uh, of the final uh, fiscal policy uh, outcomes. When having, when having this, uh, this, uh, uh, sorry, uh, when having this uh, at our disposal, the discretion, the cyclical component, the multipliers, we are also assess whether fiscal policy is, tends to behave uh, procyclically, anticyclically, or acyclically. And this can be seen from, from this graph, where, where uh, fiscal impulses generated by the two, two uh, alternative methods are shown against the uh, output gap of the Czech economy over the past uh, more than 10, 10 years. And here you can see that there is no obvious link between uh, discretionary fiscal uh, measures or fiscal impulse and business cycle in the recent decade. Sometimes the Czech uh, fiscal policy uh, has been uh, procyclical, such as in uh, years 2011, 2013, 2015, or 2021, 
whereas only sometimes to, uh, it was uh, counter-cyclical, uh, such as in the years of 2013 uh, and 2016 or 2020. So ideally, we would like to see a strong negative correlation between these two um, uh, time series to, to, to be able to say that fiscal policy as a stabilization authority helps the monetary policy with stabilization of the economy close to the potential or close to the equilibrium by conducting anti-cyclical fiscal policy. But this has not always been uh, the case because of the uh, <coughs> many, many factors uh, standing uh, potentially, uh, par at least partly, uh, outside the, the econ economic, economic uh, agenda. Now, let me shortly uh, brief uh, the role of fiscal policy in the actual uh, CNB's forecasting uh, exercises. Um, as you uh, have seen now, we are able to extract important necessary information from the uh, pu uh, public uh, the budget and from the fiscal policy of the government to be able to uh, explicitly insert it into our quarterly macro forecast and to work with that Despite the fact that our uh, core forecasting model, which is general equilibrium uh, stochastic uh, model, hasn't had yet uh, uh, an explicit fiscal block, we are able to insert the influence of the uh, fiscal policy via, via expert uh, judgments. That's why we are able to insert the fiscal impulse and to dedicate it to individual uh, demand side uh, components Within the, uh, within the work with, with, the, with the fiscal policy effects in our whole model. Uh, we are also able to compute the effects of indirect exchanges on uh, CPI, on inflation, because uh, indirect taxes typically uh, tend to uh, be seen in the, in the prices of final goods and, uh, of, in final prices of goods and uh, services. There is a quite complicated iterative process between uh, fiscal experts and monetary experts and macro experts in our, in our bank. But in the end of the day, we come up with the macro forecast, which is consistent with the expected intention of fiscal policy. And simultaneously, it gives uh, a macro outlook and the independent fiscal outlook having uh, having uh, taken into account all the elasticities and all the relationships we are able to identify uh, to exist in, the, in, our, in our economy. I will skip this, this, this slide uh, possibly, but, but the, the process is uh, very, very, uh, very uh, highly sophisticated and it takes uh, um, several iterative rounds to come up with the final uh, unbiased result. Let me uh, spend uh, some time with uh, mentioning uh, the explicit policy interactions. Um, believe it or not, uh, there are no explicit. Uh, there is there is no explicit uh, coordination, ex ante coordination between monetary policy and government uh, economic policy in the Czech Republic. The fiscal policy is carried out by the government, which is a uh, an outcome of the political process. Whereas monetary policy is conducted by, the, by an independent institution, which is the Czech National Bank, which primary uh, uh, role is maintaining price stability. And besides that, it, we also uh, uh, take care of financial stability and for banking supervision and, and, and uh, things like that. But monetary policy, when setting interest rates, needs to know the most likely future development of the economy, including the effects of the fiscal policy, which I have just uh, described how to, how to measure it and how to calculate it. That's why we took account of, uh, we take account of fiscal developments and are able to uh, fully, fully, fully uh, incorporate it into the, into the forecast and into the formulation of, of our monetary policy. But, but those uh, fiscal policy discretionary measures are taken, uh, as I was already mentioning, as an exogenous input because those are standing beyond our, our, uh, our scope. The Czech National Bank, uh, together with uh, many other uh, ministries and many other stakeholders, uh, take stance on, uh, to selected proposed laws or amendments of the law via so-called interministerial uh, comments uh, procedure, which is which is an important fora for, uh, for uh, exchanging views on pre on preparing on prepared uh, uh, 
legislation. Uh, the potential uh, influence of Czech National Bank's financial results on, uh, on government budget could uh, stem from the profit transfer from the CNB uh, to the, to the uh, state budget, but uh, this has been only uh, uh, the case of uh, 1993 year, and since then we haven't trans transferred any, any money to the state budget because of our long-term uh, losses, which are directly related to uh, revaluation losses of our foreign exchange reserves. But in other countries where the, um, the central bank is uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, in, uh, in a positive balance, when the central bank makes, makes profits, the, the transfer of profits to, to the state is a typical, typical um, um, relationship. Uh, we need to uh, ensure smooth exchange of news and information between uh, uh, government and the central bank, and that's why there are several uh, channels of uh, the uh, exchange of, of uh, information on a, on a working level between ministries and the Czech National Bank, but as I already mentioned, there is no explicit ex ante coordination of the policies because we are independent and the uh, government has its own policy uh, program. In principle, uh, from that, from, from, uh, because of that, uh, in principle, the Czech National Bank abstains or refrains from providing normative comments on concrete fiscal and structural measures of the government. Uh, we sometimes uh, make clear that uh, there, is, uh, there are some uh, evident risks uh, regarding uh, long-term sustainability of public finance in the Czech Republic, which stem from the uh, long-term cost of aging and that will influence uh, over decades uh, the, uh, uh, the, <coughs> the outlays of uh, a pension system, uh, long-term care system and healthcare system. We also uh, remind the general public of the necessity to uh, provide fiscal policy in a sound way with growth-friendly uh, policies that are not distorting uh, the market mechanism. And we also uh, make, uh, make clear that there are some internationally binding uh, rules or international uh, commitments that the Czech uh, Republic has to respect. But this is, uh, let's say, uh, without normative, normative uh, essence, and this is just uh, uh, within our uh, information, uh, information uh, uh, services to the, general, to the general public. One specific topic in this area is the potential future euro adoption in this, in this country. As you know, the Czech, National, uh, Czech Republic has been a member uh, state of the uh, European Union with the derogation on uh, Euro adoption. So we, we only have temporary um, exemption from the necessity to adopt Euro, but, but the timing of Euro adoption is on our own decision. That's why the Czech National Bank, together with the Minister of Finance, prepares a regular material for the government in which we assess together with our colleagues from the Ministry of Finance the economic preparedness and the other uh, relevant factors that uh, the, and the preparedness of the economy for the potential, potential euro adoption. Final part of my presentation is dedicated to the current fiscal outlook. As you know, the uh, Czech government uh, provided the economy with extra stimulus uh, over the past couple of years when the economy was hit by the coronavirus pandemic and the government was uh, helping uh, the uh, economic uh, agents, the firms and uh, employees to withstand the shock by <clears throat> providing job retention schemes and, uh, in, uh, and let's say, uh, 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 some, some, some uh, uh, liquidity, liquidity programs. Those effects were really sizable and really significant. And as you can see in this, in this graph, the effect on, on uh, the total uh, economic activity was quantified uh, to be 1.5 percentage point in uh, 2020 and 0.4 percentage point in 2021. 20, uh, For this year, those uh, pandemic-related measures are going to expire because they were, um, uh, let's say, uh, introduced to tackle this, this specific period of time. That's why we can expect that fiscal policy will turn from the positive to negative, from 
expense generator to a restrictionary uh, policy stance, which will be, which will be uh, driven by a uh, negative effect of uh, private consumption. Um, but the rest restrictive effect of fiscal policy for this year will be partly uh, compensated by the increase at, uh, in the taxpayer discount for personal income tax, which is the second phase of the previous abolition of so-called so gross, gross, uh, gross um, super gross wage. We, in this year, have seen uh, non-standard uh, indexation of the old age pensions. In other words, at the end of, uh, at the beginning of the year, the government increased the old age pensions uh, be going beyond the standard indexation formula. And following the uh, very high uh, uh, price growth, there will be, there will be several f uh, further rounds of uh, such a, such a uh, indexation of pensions uh, throughout the rest of, of this year. And there are also uh, quite significant and growing expenditures related to the refugee crisis as uh, many Ukrainians uh, came uh, to the Czech Republic uh, as an effect of the Russian aggr uh, Russia's aggression to their, to their country. Here you can see the table summarizing uh, everything which is important for uh, the Czech National Bank and hopefully for the general public when looking at the fiscal policy in the country. You can see the government budget balance, which is uh, in uh, very um, deep uh, deficits in recent years because of the pandemic and because of the uh, anticyclical uh, discretionary fiscal policy of previous uh, governments. You can see the adjusted balance, which is, uh, which is uh, government balance net of one-off and temporary effects. You, you, you can see the cyclical component, the structural balance, and from that derived uh, fiscal, fiscal stance. And the final uh, row is uh, dedicated to the government, government debt, which has been in, uh, increasing over the past couple of years, but we are still uh, co quite uh, safely below 60% uh, of uh, Maastricht, uh, Maastricht criterion and below uh, those levels that are imposed by the Czech uh, law on uh, fis fiscal sustainability, uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal uh, sustainability law in which the so-called uh, uh, debt break is, is uh, described. Let me now uh, conclude and summarize my presentation by uh, uh, ex uh, emphasizing that uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, there, are, there is no explicit ex ante uh, coordination between uh, monetary and fiscal policy, but the Czech National Bank takes very strong and very deep and detailed efforts to disentangle and to identify the effects of fiscal policy on macroeconomic uh, development, which is a key for its macroeconomic forecast based on which the monetary policy is formulated. So those two policies are keeping, let's say, polite distance, but they know very well about each about the other, and those will hopefully assure that the current inflation period will come uh, sh uh, soon uh, to an end. Having said that, I would like to thank you for attention for now, ladies and gentlemen, and I am now prepared to answer your questions. Dear guest, so please, the first question. Please. Hello, my name is Jan Maciek. I uh, am from the Department of Economics here uh, of the University. I have one question to you. Uh, I saw in your presentation that uh, there is no Type communication, or there is no type cooperation, not communication, but cooperation uh, between Czech National Bank and uh, Czech government. Uh, don't you think, regarding the highest inflation in the modern era of the Czech Republic, that there is time for the tighter communication, uh, respectively coordination now? And uh, are there any actions towards this? Currently in the Czech National Bank or in the government. Thank you. 
Thank you for your very relevant uh, question. Uh, the thing I, I has just described is, was the institutional setup. And that's, that's clear that uh, based on our uh, historical track record and based on the rule, uh, rules and uh, laws which are uh, in the European Union, we have to, ha we have, to have such a, such a setup as, as it is. But it is absolutely essential that both monetary and fiscal policy authorities know what are the current uh, most uh, pressing issues in the economy, which is currently inflation, and that both monetary and fiscal policy uh, do their best to address this issue. That's why we, as an independent central bank, have been uh, on a hiking cycle with our um, uh, interest rates for almost one year now. And we have hiked interest rates since uh, June last year from 0.25% to the current level of 5.75%. And we were one of the first central bank around the globe that started this hiking cycle to, uh, in a forward-looking way uh, to, to, uh, to uh, bring inflation and mounting inflationary pressures. But simultaneously, we produce our comments and our analyses in which Colleagues from our, um, uh, the colleagues from Ministry of Finance or from the government, government uh, 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 level could see that fiscal policy could play an important role in helping us to bring inflation back to our 2% inflation target. We cannot advise them directly or to, to, to tell them directly do this or do that, but they should be aware, and I am sure that they are aware of the fact that fiscal consolidation, which is necessary uh, as such, if conducted uh, in a smart way, in a growth-friendly way, but simultaneously by uh, addressing the, the current issue, which is uh, demand uh, side of the economy escalating and being above the, the potential of the supply side, that such a consolidation could also uh, uh, help us to bring inflation uh, downwards. That's why we are, uh, and we have been uh, very, very uh, keen on saying, uh, on, on, uh, keen on hearing that the government imposed a uh, freeze of uh, wages in certain, um, uh, in the majority of public, uh, public uh, employees, that they are relatively uh, conservative in terms of their plans regarding social benefit spending and other, other uh, current spending. And we hope that uh, this will uh, uh, be also true uh, for the near future because, because this country needs really to uh, solve this problem with inflation. And fiscal policy is potentially a very effective tool uh, how to uh, stabilize the economy and how to uh, bring inflation. That, that's why we communicate as we communicate. Our bank board, our governor, and the new governor, the upcoming governor, has expressed uh, there or his view that fiscal policy must uh, be aware of, the, of their potential role in this battle against inflation. And we hope that fiscal policy will help us as, as much as possible. Thank you for your answer. Uh, next question from the audience, please. Or, yes. Professor Hayek. My name is Hayek. Please, uh, are there any positive uh, examples um, for countries where central bank has to follow or support government fiscal policy? I mean some countries in Asia where they follow not only economic growth but also other social uh, targets or goals. Yeah, uh, the institutional setup uh, differs country from country or region from, uh, from region. And we, as an integral part of the European Union, must respect the, the institutional setup which is given by uh, the EU legislation that said that the central bank is independent body, that the primary uh, objective is maintaining price stability, etc. So there are so many countries around the globe in which the institutional setup, the historical track record differs from what we have had uh, in the European Union and in our country. And uh, the local circumstances 
are, to, are uh, uh, quite often so, such that uh, the central bank is an agent of the central government and it, it directly uh, promotes the policies, economic, social and other policies of the government and the country is happy with that without any obvious uh, macroeconomic imbalances or, or problems. But uh, the history, economic theory and economic uh, um, expertise uh, teaches us that in the developed countries, the setup of, the, of an independent institution that is responsible for price stability and financial stability which is not under direct influence of the political cycle, is the best way how to ensure long-term stability of, the, such a, of such an economy, which is the precondition, maintaining stability is a precondition for long-term economic sustainable growth and job creation. This is how the Western world is functioning. This is something which is typical for European Union, United States, United Kingdom, Australia, and many other uh, you know, developed countries. And in that sense, I would say that uh, we, are, we are not behind um, uh, the curve. And uh, in, many, in many cases, we provide our colleagues from less developed countries in Asia and Africa with technical assistance on how to organize macroeconomic policies in their respective countries, how to set up independent institution as a central bank, how to equip the central bank with, uh, uh, <clears throat> with certain uh, responsibilities and uh, instruments, and how to ensure the, uh, let's say, <clears throat> deviation or, or uh, isolation, mutual isolation of fiscal and monetary policy, which is, uh, in our experience, the best way how to conduct uh, these, these policies. So in the meantime, if I may, and in the meantime, someone will gather the courage to ask a question. Uh, during the last 15 years, I observed a strange thing. Uh, during, uh, let's say, uh, 2006, 7, 8, we had a social democrat government, which is naturally prone to spend more and uh, then, on 2000, uh, at 2008, we elected uh, more conservative parties, which promoted uh, fiscal consolidation. Now, we again had, let's say, several good years, and we again had a political party, ANO, uh, and we can say spending left and right, and just before a crisis, another crisis came, we again elected for someone who was promoting fiscal consolidation. So what is uh, your opinion on political cycle and business cycle coordination in Czech Republic? As I, as I was trying to uh, show the uh, procyclicality or countercyclicality of the fiscal policy in the Czech Republic, is something which is not a deep parameter of, of, of the economy or of the, of the policy, and it really depends on actual circumstances and actual, uh, let's say, uh, outcome of the, of the general, general elections. Uh, so, and typically, I would say, or, or basically, uh, the Czech uh, uh, public, uh, sorry, Czech, Czech general public is relatively very conservative. So we, from the history, we like uh, having small debts, having sm uh, low interest rates, having low countries premia, having stable or even appreciating exchange rate. And any policy that is endangering such a conservative macroeconomic, macroeconomic setup is uh, going to be replaced by a more conservative or more fiscal, fiscal prudent uh, policy. That's why those changes between left-hand left, uh, 
left uh, wing and uh, right wing uh, parties in our in our uh, recent history you have just uh, nicely nicely described so so possibly uh, the Czech uh, people Czech, Czech citizens are uh, very in a, in a financial way they are very conservative and very uh, let's say um, careful in uh, hearing those voices that would bring the, uh, bring plans for making huge uh, public spending programs without saying simultaneously how the government will pay for it uh, when when having uh, lo uh, the strong uh, uh, budget budget constraint and this is something which will hopefully prevail in this country because it is uh, uh, preserving us from getting to uns unsustainable uh, fiscal policy uh, in for the for the future that the Generation Z inherited those traits and in the meantime, anyone thought about the question from a guest? Yes, please, again. No <laughs> when coronavirus came, uh, our government spent a lot of money in order to keep the structure of the economy. First, I thought that uh, the government deficit will be better after the coronavirus uh, will be uh, behind us. But uh, nowadays it seems that uh, the government wasn't able to uh, take the following steps in order to reduce the deficit. What, what remains in the structure of the budget that influences, uh, that influences the budget in, in a negative way? Uh. The abolition of the super gross wage was a very significant uh, revenue side measure that uh, decreased uh, the public sector revenues uh, by a huge amount of money for, forever, let's say. So one, 100 uh, billion crowns each year uh, will, be, will be missing in uh, the state budget uh, uh, as from last year uh, for, the, for the next uh, next years. This is something which any government will have to solve in, in the uh, coming uh, coming uh, years, uh, the social system in the Czech Republic is also quite generous. Uh, there is, um, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, institutional setup that uh, does not uh, stimulate people who uh, lose their jobs to uh, find a new one uh, quickly because the uh, generosity of social system is uh, demotivating uh, that. Uh, we have uh, spent and we will spend definitely a lot of money on our uh, uh, pension system, uh, long-term care, uh, long uh, long care system and healthcare system. And this problem will uh, increase over time because of the aging population. Uh, so I would say the government has uh, come to a public budget situation where the consolidation was obvious. The, 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 the consolidation for the the need for for public consolidation was obvious, but the energy crisis and the war in Ukraine has now uh, changing everything, including the actual plans of the current government. That's why I was showing that uh, uh, the the fiscal policy, on the one hand, is conducted with a with an effort to gradually bring the deficit uh, down including in structural terms. But simultaneously, over time, there are impulses for the government, stemming from the energy crisis and the refugee crisis, to increase specific, uh, <coughs> uh, specific uh, expendit uh, exp expenditure programs or to uh, pr financially promote the Czech, Czech households and to help them to, to, to uh, withstand the uh, terrible increases of energy prices which is, which is uh, offsetting the, the initial effort to consolidate. So, so uh, we will see, but as I was mentioning, uh, the possibly restriction, restrictive fiscal policy would definitely help the central bank with the fight against inflation. Thank you very much for your time, for your answers, and for delivering your speech. Ladies and gentlemen, it was my pleasure. The next speaker and
And the next person I would like to join us here came from Norway, from Christiania College University as a Dean of School of Economics, Technology and Innovations, Mr. Morten Ilgans. stage is yours. Thank you. Everything's okay? So, thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the rector, vice rector, dean, for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, I would like to... Um, I have a few slides here, so I need to speed up a bit and, uh, and, uh, and take you through a little tour. Uh, the point is that I have a bit of a complex background. Uh, I've been working in uh, AI, artificial intelligence, since, uh, for a long while, since 1988. Uh, I worked uh, for 10 years uh, uh, doing research in AI, and then I moved on. After my PhD, I did uh, a... Um, started a company in, uh, that uh, is an innovation-driven entrepreneur, entrepreneurial company. It's a startup, an uh, AI-based startup, delivering decision support system for the oil and gas industry. So I did that for 10 years. And then I moved back to Norway, and I uh, started um, uh, in the higher education uh, sector in Norway, where I've been uh, vice rector twice and dean twice and director of development once and, 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 and several things. So today I'm going to weave different stories from this to something that might hopefully be a coherent whole. Let's see if that will be successful. Uh, and uh, I did start with calling this from technology transfer to ecosystem participation. Let's see if that's really what this is all about. That'll be exciting for me as well. And I think one of the things we should discuss, uh, a question we should ask ourselves is, what are the roles of the university? Uh, and that is what I will end up with. But uh, uh, we know that education, research, and engagement are the three main roles. The last point here is often called something else, but I call it engagement. Uh, and you will see why. Um, uh, but one important part of engagement, engagement with the society around us more directly, more immediate and more uh, and, and contribute to the social and, and economical development of society more directly, that engagement, uh, one of the ways that we work uh, with that, of course, in universities is uh, often under the headline innovation. So let's, let's talk a little bit about how that is doing, gone. Uh, I would like to mention Vannevar Bush. He was a particular um, interesting person in, 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 in the way that universities in, in the Western world has developed, uh, have developed. He had a seminal role in directing the marriage, if you want, of governmental funding and scientific research uh, before the Second World War and during and, and, and just after. He shifted. The, the, the high cost of, of this, of large, or the cost of, of, of uh, scientific research from, to, to some extent, from industry to the government. Uh, and that made it possible for large, big science experiments that industry could not uh, address. Uh, basically, it was uh, 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 addressing a market failure, if you want, in, in how innovation and, and research should, should play a part in society. So, in a way, he was the architect of the military-industrial complex. But after the war, uh, he, he engineered that he got a, 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 a request from the president uh, to produce a report stating how science and the universities could be funded, how research could play a role in, 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 in the United States. He proposed government, government support for university-based research for industry. And he wrote this um, uh, report, 
Science, the Endless Frontier, is a beautiful title, uh, July 1945. And his main, uh, main thing to learn from that uh, was, what, was that the te technological sequence, this is his quote from his report, technological sequence consists of basic research, applied research, development. Each of the successive stages depends upon the preceding. So basically, this was kind of a flowchart. Public financial support funds basic research and applied research and turns it out into technological development and innovations that bring social benefits and benefits for the economy in society. This is a push model. Uh, innovation is a linear process and uh, with no feedback loops really. Um, um, and uh, where uh, the government, the universities, and industry, industry play different roles. Uh, this role that the government, universities, and industry play was later called uh, um, triple helix. So government funds academia to do research. Academia, um, uh, with the help of technology transfer offices, uh, transfers technology to a grateful uh, businesses that turns it, monetizes it. And of course, uh, it's this linear push from academia to industry, the triple helix. Uh, this is not the way it works anymore. It works to some extent in some arenas, but the modern complex uh, uh, technology driven uh, economy, the knowledge economy has other actors, entrepreneurs, risk capital, it's a many helix uh, model uh, with innovation service providers like incubators, accelerators, data providers, data factories, local governments, clusters, innovation districts, innovation organizations. It's a mess. It's, a, it's not a helix. It's a, we don't fully know how things work. We have moved from a triple helix linear process, push driven, that is where ideas are initiated in academia and brought over to industry to something else, multi-stakeholder, non-linear processes, uh, unclear where processes starts. It's an ecosystem. And an ecosystem, everybody are, and everything is dependent on everybody else. Innovation ecosystem or entrepreneurial ecosystem. And there's something interesting with this too, is that What really was missing in, Lina, in uh, Vannevar Bush's model is that it was really based on large industries that were incum incumbents and not on disruptors. It was not an economy that disrupted markets or disrupted the way we do things. And what we know about the technologies that has been developed over the last 40 years, 30 years, is exactly that. They have disrupted. Uh, and of course, the interests of incumbents and, and, and disruptors are not always aligned. So how is academia going to manage this there in, if they think of themselves as sitting in the, in the middle of this? Well, um, it, is, it means that how universities work with engagement, with how we work with the society around us in order to, to bring forward the financial, the economical development it's more complex than before. Um, now, um, innovation is the process of creating something. This is very simplified, but I don't have time for com to make, you know, so we do it simplified. Yeah. So innovation, process of creating something new. Uh, entrepreneurship is the process of building a new business. And the innovation-driven entrepreneurship, which is the intersection between the two, you can think of it as the process of building a new business based on an innovation. Yes. So uh, typically, when uh, academia, universities collaborate on innovation, we collaborate with industry, we collaborate with incubators, with larger companies, etc., and the public sector for uh, organizational innovations. And we look at new, for, this is an example, a new method for medical images analysis. Collaborate with a, a large company for doing that. Entrepreneurship, that's small and medium sized uh, enterprises. Uh, like a, a new pizza restaurant. 
And that's fine, that's economy, you know, this is happening, but that's not of major interest for, for, for how universities work with, uh, uh, with companies around us. But the innovation-driven entrepreneurs are interesting. The IDEs, a new company, this is an example, a new company based on a new method for medical image anal analysis. And it's different how a university can work with that than how a university can work with a, a, a well-established company. Now, uh, typically uh, in innovation, maybe a professor wants to see a technology, a knowledge, or a patent being used. While um, uh, for innovation-driven entrepreneurship, maybe that professor wants to participate in starting a business or want to see or see that her uh, technology, knowledge, or patent is being brought forward by a new company. So engaging in a startup. Typically partners, industry scale-ups and tech transfer office are very important uh, actors in the innovation sphere. While in, in the IDEs, the entrepreneurial side, it's also startups and incubators and many more. So uh, these are kind of different systems. So how is Europe doing? How is Europe doing? No, I'm taking a jump. I'm going away from the university and I'm looking up to a uh, European level. And uh, there's, uh, how do we do in innovation and entrepreneurship in Europe compared to the rest of the world? Well, Europe is one, we have a challenge. Europe is playing nice all the time, that historically. Uh, we believe that the world separates economic interests from geopolitical interests. Now, EU's construction underpinned that. Most international economic powers are given to EU-level bodies, but most security and foreign policy instruments are left at the member states. I'm not saying that one thing or the other is wrong or right. I'm just saying that it's a separation that reflects that we think that the economic interest can be separated from the geopolitical interest. The rest of the world doesn't believe this. Uh, China and the United States do not separate economic interests from geopolitical interests. China and the United States are increasingly, increasingly using economic tools to gain geopolitical advantage. So, uh, export control sanctions, import rules, standards, da data regulations, the dominance of the US dollar, cyberspace, listing companies, delisting them. And of course, Europe has started to do that too. The last 10 years, more and more. What other challenges do we have in Europe? Skills shortage. What is the unemployment rate in, in the Czech Republic? 3%? 3%. <laughs> That's a problem. It's, it's great, but it's also a problem. Uh, there are real, you know, uh, there is skill shortage everywhere. Uh, we have relatively few uh, serial entrepreneurs that can pull a startup to become a scale-up. We have relatively few with technical education, uh, and we see it in the statistics all across Europe. There were 82,000 unfilled positions for engineers and ICT specialists in Germany just before the pandemic. Uh, the European Union, 55% of companies experience difficulties in recruiting ICT specialists. In Norway, uh, when we ask companies what is the biggest hindrance for growth, they all say, without all meaning 90%, getting talent. And we ask, so what do you do when you hire? And they say, half of the time we actually don't hire, even if you need somebody. The other half, we hire somebody with a lower competence level than we want, than we need it. This is a problem. Uh, what else is a challenge in Europe? Stunted value creation. Take my field. Uh, this is uh, from, I think it's from uh, 2019. It shows the distribution of artificial intelligence uh, research papers. If you look at uh, United States, China, and Europe as, as one pool, what is the distribution? And Europe is doing excellent in research and, uh, and science in AI. Fantastic. We're, we, both quality and quantity. And we have great universities and, re and research labs in, in artificial intelligence. Uh, now, what about econ AI economic players, that is, 
firms, research institutes, governmental institutions that are involved in AI. Well, that, for some reason, that's much less. I mean, you should hope to see the same reflection in, that we have in science reflected in activities. Or even unicorns. Or if you look at the number of the volume of investment, um, risk capital, venture capital investment in AI-driven companies in Europe versus in the United States, it's a tenth. Now, of course, if you take the long view, Europe has been on a sliding scale for a long while. Uh, of course, but that doesn't matter. That is just a question that the rest of the world has started to really to build up their economy, to build up their universities, to build up uh, becoming... Um, and of course, that's a natural thing. But this is more concerning because it's the last 10 years, the number of global top 100 companies. Um, or this, the Europe's share of global semiconductor capacity, uh, chips, in percent. Uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, or this market capitalization of the top 70 tech companies in the world, not in the world, between the United States, China, and Europe. Now that, what happened with the excellent research we are doing on its way to this? Why is this the case? US tech stocks are now worth more than the entire European uh, stock market. And this is the share of market capitalization of the top 50 tech companies in, uh, between the United States, China, and Europe. This is the market value of the top world's 50 largest internet companies, uh, RO, uh, rest of the world, ROW. This is Europe. Um, this are, versus 2019, the, the global leaders by market capitalization in internet companies. And I mark the European company in green. R&D spent by global top 250 R&D spenders on software and computer services. Right, uh, you get the picture, don't you? We're doing excellent in research science and what happens on its way to the market? Uh, what happens in our, with our development of our um, uh, infrastructure? Uh, where are our lighthouses? The Google, the Apple, the, uh, the uh, Amazon, what happened to Bull, what happened to Nokia. We have been able before to come together and create great institutions and great companies. But it's very hard when the discussion stops with where should the headquarters be, who should get the money, blah, blah. You know the story. We have established Airbus. United uh, European Space Agency, CERN, they are shining lighthouses for the globally. And we need to do the same in technology. We have deep technological and production dependencies on third countries. And uh, um, we see the dependency, for instance, on chips produced in other regions of the world really stunted our ability to produce in, in uh, uh, cars, for instance. Uh, Volkswagen sold 200,000 fewer cars uh, last year because they didn't have no, enough chips. Uh, that was wrong. I, was, I, I lied. It wasn't 200,000, it was 100,000. But I think that's a bad number, too. Uh, there are 103 product strat categories in electronics, chemical, minerals, pharmaceutical products, in which the EU has a critical strategic dependence on imports from China. And during the COVID, we learned that EU was severely dependent on extra EU producers. Uh, UK, US, uh, and, and, and the Far East. Uh, so um, there is sand in the machinery. Now, it's fantastically interesting because I don't understand this and I don't do research in it. I work in it, but I cannot uh, dig into what is happening because this is last year's list 
of the world's uh, most um, uh, innovative countries. And I marked every year there's a, uh, there's a ranking. Uh, there's several rankings by various measures on innovation capacity in, uh, in various countries. And I marked uh, European countries in green. Europe is doing fantastically. So what is the difference in picture here? Well, these rankings, you know, to be, have a single ranking, you need to establish one measure. So it's, it's, uh, it's an assimilation, what do you call it, uh, of, uh, of, of a lot of different indicators. If we, if, we, if, we, if we deconstruct that into the input indicators and the output indicators, we, 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 we see a different, we see an interesting picture. The input indicators are, are whatever we consider important for innovation to happen. It could be good universities, tendency to take higher education, uh, uh, governmental support for startups, uh, quality of the education system, uh, 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 you know, independent courts. You know, you, you can imagine all these are input indicators. Output indicators is actually the production, what we get out of it. And, and, and I'm going to use Norway as an example. We were number 10 in the world, if you rank them by input indicators. We have all these great things that should make it possible for Norway to really have a great innovative uh, uh, economy. But if you look at the output, something is happening. And this is typically for very many countries in Europe. And it's very different than important other countries. So what do we say? It's sand in the machinery, which isn't too bad. I mean, it's much harder to build all the infrastructure, to build all the, all the inputs to an economy. And we have done that. Europe basically has a lot of this in place. So in a sense, it's, it's not a bad situation. We have all these things. So what happens on the way to the market? Sand in the machinery. So why is this important? You know it, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is a curve showing the gross world product over many years, uh, 14,000 years, trillion twenty eleven dollars I, I didn't bother to update this. So the question is, what happened there? I'm asking you a question. What happened there? What is that really? What, is, what it was the Industrial Revolution? To a large extent, it is innovation and technology. Of course, with the existence of uh, energy. Science, innovation, technology created that curve. Innovations and the technology, uh, technologies drive the economy. This is not a car. It's an extremely complex piece of technology. And that's a result of innovations over years. Artificial intelligence, the new electricity, it's is, is been said. Why? Technology is um, uh, create value opportunities, innovations. Innovations are also important, uh, and technology is important because they are key for operation. And it's important because, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, this is, uh, uh, there's a reason why I'm telling you this too. I'm getting back, to, but innovation is the basis for geopolitical power. Now, Alfred Thayer Mayen, I don't know anything but him except that he believed that whoever holds the command of the seas will control the world. And I know he believed that because of the technological development and innovation in seafaring, in ships. Or that when Halford Mackinder in 1904 said something similar about land masses, his belief was that geopolitical power would be based on trains and railroad tracks. And somebody believed that the nation that leads in artificial intelligence will be the ruler of the world. And we know who said that. So technology 
And innovation is the basis for geopolitical power. There's no way around that. It's, a, it's the basis for strategic sovereignty. It is, yeah, it's the, a disruptor of power. Uh, we see that in the conflict in Ukraine. We've seen that in Somalia. We've seen it all over. Techno innovation and technology disrupts markets, disrupts politics, and disrupt geopolitical power. Now, so I'm asking, why is technology innovation important? You know it. Uh, nearly half of jobs are vulnerable to automation. Uh, big challenges with using technology in interfering in, in each other's uh, uh, domestic issues. And innovation and technology, and this is important, is key to address our grand challenges. What do we know about the future? We know one thing about the future. It's, it's difficult. 250 million uh, glo uh, uh, migrants in the world today, pandemics, uh, drug resistance uh, bacteria, uh, carbon emissions, uh, and uh, we have uh, deforestation of the size of Greece every year. Our populations are getting older. Um, the, the population growth is of the size of Italy every year. We have autonomous weapons. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, technology-driven societal control. Now, technology and innovation is the cause of all of this. It's not only that, innovation and technology, they, they, they drive the way we think about the world. When clock towers started to come up in, in town squares across Europe, suddenly we started to think differently about the world. Suddenly, we thought the universe was a clockwork or that our brains were cogs and wheels. And it changed the way we lived and worked and talked and, 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 and prayed and, uh, and, and voted. It changed everything. And then steam did the same. Electricity did the same. Frankenstein's monster was created by electricity. Life came from electricity. And now we are all computers. Innovation influences how we look at the world. It shapes what we think. It uh, influences our values. It decides, actually, it, it influences what we talk about over breakfast with our dear ones. And innovations and technology decide our sovereignty. And that I will. So that's the next little chapter in this weaving through stories. What does this mean? Innovations decide our sovereignty. Well, sovereignty is a function of having secure access to whatever one is dependent on. Secure access doesn't mean we have to be an autocracy. It doesn't mean we have to have everything with our own, our own national borders. But we have to have trusted access to food, water, energy, technology, data. You would know by now, by what I just told you, why technology is an important part of any region or any countries or the European Union sovereignty. So that means competence is one of the things we are dependent on to secure our sovereignty and innovation capacity. Yeah. Uh, that was a funny, uh, something happens when this was moved to a PC from a, la from a Mac, this, but you can read it. It's technological sovereignty. Uh, it's the ability of a country to generate technological and, and scientific knowledge autonomously. Not only a country, it could be a group of country, like the European Union. Um, or to use technological cap capabilities developed outside of the region through the activation of reliable partnerships. But you get that. 
Digital sovereignty is the ability of a country or a group of countries to act independently within the digital world. What, what does that mean? That includes sovereign main management of the cyberspace. Do we have control of our servers, of the data flowing through our networks? Uh, and who can tap into them? In Norway, if, if, you send, uh, if you call somebody on a cell phone from the southern part to the northern part or send an email, it might very easily go through Sweden. Sweden's uh, um, uh, um, intelligence service uh, has the right to tap into any correspondence on their networks by foreigners. So they have full access to the communication going from the northern part of Norway to the southern part of Norway. Sweden has, uh, the intelligence services have a, uh, have a um, agreement with the British intelligence service about exchanging information. So that flows to U UK. And the UK has the same agreement with the United States. So our data ends up somewhere we don't want, possibly. Do we have, does Europe have digital sovereignty? If not, how can we get it? Innovation sovereignty is the next step. The ability of a country to exploit technologies for the development of new economic activities. And uh, that, that is enabled by technological sovereignty. And then economic sovereignty, the ability of a country to generate value and prosperity independently. And then we know economic sovereignty requires unimpeded access to natural resources, capital, technologies, innovation capacity, production capacity, infrastructures, finances, skills, and data. And then strategic sovereignty, which has become very important. The ability of a country to play an autonomous and strategic role in geopolitical context. Yes, um, so all these things build on each other. Technological, digital sovereignty, innovation, sovereignty, economical sovereignty, strategic sovereignty. And there you see the importance of the universities and their work in engaging in their third role, the engagement with society around. Because the technological sovereignty, the seeds of the technological and digital sovereignty and innovation sovereignty is higher education systems, research institutions, uh, strong uh, innovation capacity, uh, startups, investors, but universities play a seminal role. And how are universities going to play their role? So now I just, I, I, I created like a link between universities and all the bad things in the world and the good things because there is this link. And that's why Europe, the last five years at least, have been very focused on digital sovereignty, uh, but Germany, France, EU, France's new mantra, liberty, equality, digital sovereignty. Um, and we see how the EU is pushing out one instrument after the other. And it is in a large picture. It's in a so sovereignty picture. Uh, four years ago, when 24 European countries signed an AI pact in a bid to compete with the US and China, is a part of that. Uh, we need to invest 20 billion a year in AI. Uh, the uh, EU data strategy from 2020. Uh, and now, just three months ago, two months ago, the European Chips Act, where EU unveiled a 43 billion plan to address semiconductor shortage. It's not only about shortage, it's about securing access to key technology. That's why we are now in Europe's digital decade. Anything from common data infrastructures and low power processors to digital public administration and pan-European deployment of 5G corridors. Right. So, the European Parliament um, just a month ago passed a 
statement, uh, accepted a report on, uh, from the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Age. And it, it says, this report says, we uh, the European Parliament observes that the digital revolution has, at the same time, triggered a global tech race in which digital, oops, I'm pushing the wrong button there, in which digital sovereignty is seen as a prerequisite for great power status in both political and economical terms, stresses the growing realization among decision makers that emerging technologies could lead to a global power shift away from the Western world, points out that Europe, which for centuries set international standards, dominated technological progress and led in high-end manufacturing and deployment, has therefore fallen behind in a new winner-takes-most or superstar economy, underlines the risk of European values being globally replaced and our companies becoming marginalized and our living standards being drastically reduced, underlines, underlines secondly that the EU is failing to commercialize its groundbreaking technological innovations. You know, the statistics I show you. Great in science, what happened on the way to the market. Thereby enabling fast-growing non-European corporations to take our best ideas, our best talent and companies. Points out that as a result, only eight of today's top 200 digital companies are domiciled in the EU, while our economic growth is constantly declining. Notes that Europe's high wages and the world's most generous social welfare system are financially dependent on us competing with the rest of the world. So that's that statement uh, the European Parliament passed a month ago. So then I asked, what are the roles of the university? Well, uh, we said uh, education, research and engagement and I will focus a bit on engagement, namely to contribute to the social and economical development of society. Um, the transformation and development of society is driven or partially is dependent on the health of our higher education institutions and research institutions. It's dependent on our universities. And the third point, engagement, that means that universities need also, remember, the complexity of collaborating with their economy today versus during Vannevar Bush. It's more complex. So our engagement, our work in this new reality means a lot for a university. We do work placements, university hospitals, refugees and immigrants we collaborate with, industry collaborations, of course, applied research where we, uh, uh, where we work together, uh, uh, missions, uh, innovation, education, educating next generation of innovators, entrepreneur education, uh, innovation of course itself, entrepreneurship, technologies transfer, shared workspaces, incubator accelerators, ecosystem engagement, clusters, innovation districts, all of these things are things that universities are doing today, more or less, to some degree. The world has become more complex, and the universities have become more complex, and with all the challenges on the table of, of any poor minister in any country, it's this, this pile with challenges, when, when she is asked what are you going to, how are you going to address these long-term trend uh, challenges? Well, they always turn and point to us. Let's say, science, research, innovation. It's going to solve, help our way out. And then we have to ask what kind of universities. Let me use a, tell a little story that all of you have heard, I believe, about Kodak. But I'm going to just touch upon it anyway. It's, it's partially a myth, but I don't care. It's a good story. In 1973, Gareth Lloyd and Stephen Sassoon at Kodak invented this and patented this. 
the world's first digital camera. Uh, wasn't pretty good, but it was patented, and this is uh, Sassoon, and this in 89, Kodak had digital cameras like this. But uh, Kodak didn't want to really execute on, on this invention. Uh, management said no one would ever want to watch the pictures on a TV set. And, uh, and, and, and what is the consequence? You know, these are the number of film rolls that are sold. Um, I wonder if this, uh, yeah. at the peak, uh, was exactly when the students that started at Christiane and Oslo met and all the universities across Europe, the 19 year old, they were born that year. They were born when, when they were the most film roles sold in the world and when Kodak was a global brand that was, uh, had 140,000 employees. Um, but then, then it, it went down and what happened? What was Kodak's purpose? Kodak's purpose was to sell film. And of course, uh, selling f the digital camera would defeat the purpose of the company. So what would have been a higher purpose? That could be storytelling or memories or images. If that had been the purpose of Kodak, they might have been able to transition better. Now, it might be... Uh, so there is an analogy here. What is the purpose of the universities? Is it to educate and do research? That's what we say. Or is it something else? What would be a higher purpose? What would be the... Is, is educate and research the higher education equivalent to selling film? I think we should think about that. If we ask Marianne, who started at Oslo Met uh, last year, she was uh, born, uh, last year, 2021, she was born in Y2K plus uh, 2. And uh, she's, what is that number? 2070. That's when she's going to retire, yeah? approximately. It's as long, a, until as 69 is long ago. And if we ask her, she knows the following. We, she knows the future is scary. She knows about the stories, about all the trends and all the challenges. And when we ask her, what is the purpose of the university? And we ask, is it education? Is it research? She says, nah, it's not. It's to make a better future. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech and the audience. Now, is it, already I can see a raised hand. Uh, if you need, we can pass you a microphone. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Martin. A very nice uh, presentation. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. I have a question. So, to make a better future, you said before that future is difficult. Yeah. So, what, so I would say to make a less difficult future. In that scope, um, what, what, do you have numbers? So you present these numbers with uh, with China, US, and Europe. Um, I wonder uh, how are the numbers now with the present geopolitical situation with the with the with the war and so on. Do you have numbers on that? And in the specific, my second question is specifically uh, uh, within AI. And in that geopolitical situation, AI, so there, are, there will be lots of demands from AI research and education and innovation, I think. Cybersecurity, is this something that will substitute or, or uh, I don't know, dominate the AI basic research? What is your opinion about? You know, that was more than one question. <laughs> but uh, first of all, I don't, have, I don't have numbers for the situation now. Uh, we are in, in, in difficult... Uh, ma there are many different uh, things happening at the same time in the world that, that, that is an upheaval for Europe. Uh, and I do uh, 
And when I'm asking, when I'm saying to make a better future, it's not that I have answers. It's just that we need to ask, maybe ask new questions, different questions. And we need to look at our jobs uh, uh, at the universities as having a higher level. I mean, it's easier to transition to a modern university uh, with other ways of teaching, other way of engaging uh, uh, outside. If we are freeing ourselves from our path dependencies in how, what it means to be a university and what it means to educate, uh, have, have study programs and do research. If we, if we and, and, and do innovation, which is uh, the path dependency there is, is, is very strong and it is the linear model. Uh, so my point is only the following, that uh, uh, by trying to lift us up in, in what our uh, purpose is, uh, we might be able to free ourselves a bit from this path dependency and do things differently and adapt faster to the complexities of the world and the complex demands that are put on the shoulders of the universities of today. Uh, now, how has the last geopolitical developments changed things? Uh, well, first of all, we see that technology has played interesting, I would say interesting quotes, uh, 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 roles uh, geopolitically, and we see that there will be more, uh, more research on, uh, on, you, on, te on AI, cyber I don't think cyber security is going, I mean AI is a part of cyber security now, cyber security now. Uh, and, but all kinds of deep technologies, deep techs are going to see, should see an increased uh, focus from the universities. But then, I'm trying to also connect that to the role of the universities in bringing this, connect this with uh, value creation in society. And that is more complex than before. It's a particularly bad answer. I don't, I, don't, I don't have a good answer, sorry. Thank you, and I can see my colleague here. Okay, so if I may, you have outlined many problems, and I wonder how many of those problems can even be solved by universities. Now we have, uh, we were speaking about value creation. So my thought is maybe the problem is in the market. So your example was EU, United States, China. China has a still capital controls. That's why they have so many home homegrown players, like Alabama, for instance. So, is your case for sovereignty capital controls? No, uh, uh, no, not capital controls. Uh, what I'm saying is that um, um, the modern, uh, the technology-driven dri uh, development uh, of the last uh, 20 years has, to some large extent, been actually. Well, uh, technologies have been developed in, in uh, universities and outside of universities and research labs and in, in, in larger companies. Uh, but um, uh, our political system, uh, not system, but the way, the way governments in, in the way the Norwegian government, to some extent the way the Commission, European Commission is thinking about innovation is, is still the linear model. You can see it in this, how, the, how the structure of the funding systems are. So I think one of the things we need to do is to develop a, a, a greater understanding for how uh, how this is not a linear model, how, and, and then we need to start, I think universities have a role to play in helping developing healthy entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystems. Uh, we cannot sit inside of walls and wait for somebody to knock on them, to knock on our door. Uh, I think we need to engage in establishing in innovation uh, districts, in, in, in establishing uh, uh, um, uh, university, uh, in, in establishing incubators where universities and students from universities and professors from universities can collaborate with, in, with startups and investors, etc. We need to start to talk with investors, not only the larger industries. We need to see how we can develop our role in a more complex ecosystem. And by doing that, there is no quick fix, but uh, it, it's keeping, uh, staying on the path that is very path dependent, uh, it's, uh, it's not going to solve this problem. We need to expand on our engagement role, and it's a more complex role. Thank you. Please, another question. Uh, 
question from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, in the last part of the, your lecture, you mentioned uh, the, the opinions of young people, and we can recognize it also here that young people are afraid. Of the yes. Uh, of course, it reduced their motivation. So, what could be the role of the universities uh, in the work with the uh, young generation to change this attitude? And the second question. Uh, if uh, when you compare the China, United, uh, United States, and Europe, uh, with, um, and the development of our ability to, to transfer outputs of our research to the commercialization, uh, isn't it uh, also connected with our attitude to the uh, uh, to the sustainability, to the care of about uh, the climate changes, and, and so on? Because we have a lot of rules, and definitely, if you compare. Uh, how, for example, China attitude to this problem, uh, there are not definitely uh, equal conditions uh, in competition. So, these two questions. Thanks. Okay, one question is about how we can engage students. Uh, because they, they are disillusioned and they don't know why they should start at a university, uh, something like that. And the other one is what are the conditions uh, for science and universities in China in, for instance, battling missions and the law for instance, climate change are different. Uh, they're given in some, some ways. Uh, we are hemmed in by more regulations. Uh, yeah, those are okay. The first one is, I do believe that by creating uh, study programs that engages and you know, uh, how, do we talk, how do we talk to potential students and to the students we have today? Are we putting them into uh, education models that, we have, that are small refinements of what we have done for the last 400 years? Or are we actually creating uh, study uh, programs that, uh, in, that um, for students interested in entrepreneurship or innovation actually collaborate with uh, the economy outside, whether it's startups, uh, investors, uh, uh, whatever, international relations, the more we are able to show that, the more we are communicated to, to our potential students and, and our existing students that we are trying to create a path for you here where you can thrive. We are trying to create a platform where you can contribute to this change. Because I think a lot of students are disillusioned by sitting in a classroom. They've done that for 12 years before they're going to start here. Uh, and I think we need, and for some students it's great to continue that, yeah? But I think for other students, and particularly when you look at the business, innovation, technology, we need to see a, a, a more porous membrane between the university and the, and the society around. That was number one. Uh, number two, um, yeah, I do, there is, I understand your question here. One example is, is, is uh, Europe's uh, data protection law and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and makes it hard, for instance, for us to quickly develop good and new solutions for health, uh, health applications. Um, and I, I, I do believe that uh, uh, the Europe's path has to be a path between the... the, the, the <laughs> the top-down political government and the complete market government. Europe needs to find a path that can be, can be strong for the whole world. We can, we can show that as, as a model. But I do believe that if you look at the AI regulation, the AI Act, Artificial Intelligence Act that has been proposed, it came to, at the same time as a, um, um, a, a membership engagement act in, uh, for AI. And all the focus is on how to regulate instead of on the other part, it's how to stimulate. And uh, we need to get away from, from regulating first and, and, and because we don't know the future, so we don't know what we're regulating. We need to get to a point where we actually can, to a large extent, uh, let the market try out, but be alert and be quick at fixing things if things doesn't work. Uh, the modern economy and the modern society is so complex that believing that we can see into that crystal ball and see how things are going to act out and then turn that into regulations beforehand, 
that is having a big faith in our ability to, 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 to see the future and how things are going to work out. I, I do very much agree that Europe needs to be a strong global regulator. But I do, I do believe that. I think uh, if, if we are not, who are going to take that role of making sure that we protect society and individuals? Who are? It's us. But um, it cannot only be that. And what we are missing is the stimuli of uh, a stronger stimuli of the economy, a stronger development of um, the entrepreneurial sector. And I think the commission needs to cut off their strong ties to the inc uh, incumbents uh, and, and, and focus more on the entrepreneurial economy. That was strong. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time, for your speech, and answering questions of our guests. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Eriketz. Thank you. And I know that I am the last thing between you and lunch, so I promise I'll be brief. Thank you all for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the conference and you are especially welcomed at the sessions. Who uh, is interested in uh, excursion into a brewery, please do not forget to register at the registration desk. And we'll see you, of course, also at 7 o'clock at the social event which will take place right in the atrium right in this building where the lunch will be served and tomorrow there will be several fine occasions but i would like to mention just one it's the workshop from nine o'clock on the room j13 ladies and gentlemen again thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of the conference